All right, we're going to get started. Welcome again. Um, I am Cassandra Lawson. I am the one of the co-chairs of the Urban Ag Work Group um, as part of the Fairfax Food Council. Uh, the Fairfax Food Council is a coalition of citizens, nonprofits, and other partners that uh, work to advocate and promote the food system policy change um, to benefit Fairfax County's citizens. Um, we'd like to thank the Virginia Cooperative Extension and um, Arcadia Center for Sustainable Agriculture um, for sponsoring this workshop. So what we're gonna do today is we have uh, two speakers. The first um, is Amanda Tyndall and she is the founder of Lawn to Table um, Farms. And the second speaker is a master gardener. Her name is uh, Caitlin McKeegan and she will, um, they're both gonna be speaking to you about um, different things you can do in the fall, things to incorporate or some things that maybe think about over the winter while your garden's resting. Um, uh, we're going to talk about vegetables first. Amanda's going to take that. And then Caitlin's going to talk to us about uh, plants that we can plant for the pollinators and some natives. So I'll have Amanda take it away. Thanks so much, Cassandra. Um, I first just want to thank the Virginia Cooperative Extension um, Master Gardeners, uh, the Arcadia Center for Sustainable Food and Agriculture, um, and last but not least, uh, the Fairfax Food Council for hosting this event. Um, special thanks to Cassandra for, for organizing this event um, and for Diane and Anne for your work with it too. And then obviously uh, Juan Pablo for orchestrating tomorrow's event in Spanish as well. Um, as Cassandra mentioned, my name is Amanda. I'm the founder and lead grower of a company called Lawn to Table. And I'm so excited to be talking to you today about growing a diverse fall uh, in winter garden. Um, particularly, my presentation is going to be focused on perennials today. Um, perennial that can produce uh, vegetables that you can eat uh, year on year, hopefully with low maintenance um, and plants that are going to uh, improve your soil structure overall. So um, a little bit about me. Um, Lawn to Table is really a company that I started in the last couple of years. Um, our goal is uh, is to build and maintain private residences throughout Northern Virginia. Um, it came about as emerging of a passion for small scale organic farming and um, uh, a hatred for lawns um, because we really believe that lawns can be more than just grass. Um, we really think that they can feed our families and our communities, which is part of the reason why I'm so excited to talk to you about, talk to you about perennial vegetables today. So uh, we'll jump right in. I know there are a lot of people with different uh, different experiences. A lot of you have, you know, 20, 30 plus experiences and experience in gardens. And then there's going to be some new people as well. So we'll sort of bridge, hopefully bridge the gap and, and learn a few new things together as well. I'm looking forward to hearing from Caitlin a little bit later on, on how pollinators and especially native pollinators are going to work with some of these vegetables that we'll talk about today. So just from a very basic, from a very basic perspective, um, the difference between annuals and perennials. So annual plants are gonna grow from seed, uh, flower, produce seed, and then die. So the legacy of annual plants is gonna be carried on by the planting of seeds that are created. That are created. So they live their entire life cycle within a year. Um, perennials, on the other hand, typically regrow, grow from the same root system. So they're not gonna die after producing seeds and and oftentimes they'll have seasonal growth cycles of dormancy and growth. So when they go into dormancy, it'll sometimes look as though they're dying off. Um, after they are finished with their cycle of dormancy, they'll begin to they'll begin to um, grow grow new roots there, or grow new uh, sprouts there. Um, so now that we kind of have a core understanding of the differences between annuals and perennials, um, let's talk about why perennials. Um, Annuals and perennials really can be mutually beneficial in terms of overall garden health, in terms of overall soil structure. Um, as I've mentioned, perennials can be very low maintenance uh, once they're established. So they can require very little, little cultivation to keep them going. So those of us who are short in time, um, perennials, if we do them right, they can be our best friends. Um, they'll also produce a long, provide a long-term harvest. So uh, some of these plants uh, will produce year on year uh, for 10, maybe even 20 years, um, depending on depending on their health. Um, the other added benefit to a perennial crop is that once established, 
these plants can help fill the hungry gap. So really that period between the end of our fall winter harvest and between before those those new spring plantings really have the chance to, to, to produce. Um, one of the issues that I love, I care most about gardening and agriculture is soil health. And uh, particularly perennials are special to me in that they're root structures and seasonal dormancy and decomposition um, lend themselves to an incredible level of soil health. Um, the root structures are going to make them oftentimes more drought tolerant. Roots are really going to tap deep, deep into the ground. Um, and finally, they can be a wonderful habitat for wildlife and pollinators. And again, I'm so excited to hear from Caitlin on that front as well. Um, so let's talk about what perennial soil health looks like. Um, as I mentioned, they often have a deep and extensive root system that can deep dig deeper compared to a lot of annual plants. So the perennial root structures are really gonna bind soil particles together um, and they're going to improve soil structure by breaking up those compacted layers, allowing for better water filtration and aeration. Um, just like other plants, um, perennials are gonna require essential nutrients for growth and they aid in nutrient cycle, cycling. So as, as they sort of uptake those nutrients, those nutrients are gonna be absorbed. And as leaves and other parts of the plants die and age, they fall to the ground and decompose. And this organic matter is then going to enrich the soil and provide a really rich food soy source for beneficial soil organisms. It's gonna release those nutrients back into the soil, which then in turn contributes to the nutrient availability for other plants. Um, and then finally, plants really provide a diverse and robust soil microbial community. So um, it provides a consistent food source for soil microorganisms, um, including bacteria and fungi, um, which play vital roles in that neutral nutrient cycling again, right? It's all um, a really beautiful uh, system that helps provide a more diverse ecosystem for birds, insects, and other wildlife. Um, so along with those beautiful things about perennials, there's also some real challenges that come along with them. Um, low maintenance plants are great, they're awesome. We love not having to work too terribly hard to have a good harvest, um, but the rapid and consistent growth can quickly become, they can often quickly become invasive um, if you're not careful, especially those are those that are rhizomatic in nature, right? So I know um, the Fairfax County Urban Agriculture Working Group, we've talked about sun chokes before or Jerusalem artichokes um, and how quickly they can take over an entire garden. Um, those particularly, I'm not gonna talk about those in depth today, but those particularly are recommend for containers um, because they can take over things so quickly. Um, next is just, next is just unique challenges in terms of um, pests, right? So um, while, all of these, all of the, the diverse soil activity that I just mentioned um, leads to healthy and more disease tolerant plants. Um, these perennials can sometimes be susceptible to the very thing that makes them perennials, right? Uh, susceptible to things that are going to attack their root structures. Um, good site selection, introducing beneficial insects, um, and specifically selecting variants or varietals that are going to be pest resistant and that are going to be disease resistant is a really important way to address some of those challenges. And then finally, with perennials, um, while it's not, it's not necessarily a challenge, it might be for those of us who love instant gratification, but there is a longer term uh, longer term investment with a lot of these perennials um, because they take some time to establish those healthy root structures. Um, they can take a few years to really be able to reap the harvest from them. But like most great relationships, um, putting the work in and being patient usually pays off in the long run. Um, these are just a few of the perennial plantings that we'll talk about today. Um, a couple of these, um, uh, a couple of these I may be cheating on a little, um, knowing that they're not true perennials. Um, but we'll start with uh, garlic here. Um, as I mentioned, it's a bit of a cheat because not all garlic is perennial. Um, but I, I included here simply because as many of you probably know, it's an incredible fall planting. It's the easiest, uh, to replant, um, uh, without having to purchase new, purchase new cloves in the, in the next season. Um, for annual garlic, um, a fall planting allows a harvest in spring and early summer. Uh, that's gonna happen when the stalk begins to turn brown. Um, 
annual garlic is best for culinary purposes. Um, it's going to have a much more mild flavor than the biennial garlic, biennial garlic. Um, however, biennial garlic has the chance to produce more. It'll get larger, more cloves, larger cloves. And while the flavor is much harsher that second year, they are definitely better for replanting simply because of those production levels and because of the maturity of the cloves. Um, these are the two most common ways of planting garlic. However, um, with biennial garlic, for hardneck varieties, such as rocambole or purple striped garlic, um, they're often going to produce a flower stalk called a scape. Um, that scape is going to produce bulbils at the top, uh, which then fall off and can produce more garlic. Um, it's not as common and it's not as effective as uh, propagating from cloves of garlic, but it can be done. And if you're interested in trying it out, I recommend it um, specifically with those hardneck varieties. Very similar to sort of that falling off, um, the walking onion is a really great way to get a continuous supply of, of onion throughout your year. Um, they're also known as Egyptian walking onions. Um, again, they have a very, they have a very fun structure in that um, the stalks will grow, the bulbils will grow at the top. And then they actually get too heavy for the stock to continue to carry them. And so they'll literally walk across your garden and those bulbs will fall into the ground and plant in the new space. Um, there's a couple ways to do these. I mean, you can allow them to fall or when the bulbs start to become brown, you can harvest them um, and replant. Um, they're great to harvest either as green onions or as mature bulbs in the spring as well. Um, now getting over to the true, one of the truer perennials, um, asparagus is definitely a true perennial. Um, and I say that because it regrows from the same root structure and it goes through these cycles of dormancy and regrowth. Um, the best way to plant asparagus is typically from root crowns and trenches covered with a light two inches of soil. Um, and they're gonna grow these sort of asparagus ferns, right? And, and this is gonna happen during the first season of growth. And then as it goes into dormancy, all of the real energy, all of the real activity is gonna happen in the crown. So as they grow out, they'll hit their cycle of dormancy and all of that energy and nutrients that were created during the photosynthesis process are heading back into the root, the root system. Um, at this point, once everything dies back, um, it's important not to trim the, the asparagus until they really begin to die back. And then at the dormancy phase, cutting them off at the base level. Um, at that point, they can finish out their periods of dormancy and overwinter, and you can provide a really rich level of organic material. And that second year is, is really the year in which those spears are gonna start to come up. Um, and in that second year, it's that's when it's time to, to begin harvesting gently. Um, to make sure that it continues to, to grow that root structure. Um, asparagus is one that's amazing, which is in that um, you'll be able to harvest asparagus for 10, 20 years um, if, you take, if you take good care of it. So rhubarb is very similar in, in, in the way that it, it grows from that same root structure, right? Um, it can be transplanted. I've included it here for fall because it can be transplanted in the fall. Um, yeah. However, um, the best time to do it this time of year, um, or sorry, specifically in our region within Virginia, is really in in the late in the late winter uh, in February. But either way, you do it. Um, it's important to plant rhubarb in times of dormancy, um, or to divide it in terms of dormancy. Um, one note that I will make on rhubarb specifically in our area, you know, I know Virginia has lots of really beautiful, rich clay. Um, however, it's very important for rhubarb that it has well draining soil um, with too much clay that rhubarb can begin to, to develop signs of rot. Um, and just like asparagus, rhubarb is gonna require some patience um, as the first harvest date is, is likely two years away. And even in the second year of planting, it's important to, to sort of uh, make sure that you're doing so sparingly. Um, but in your third year, you can go wild and maybe harvest some wild strawberries and make all the strawberry rhubarb pie you'd like in the world. So um, I'm whenever I think about um, 
whenever I think about our, our winter vegetables, right, our winter greens or our fall, late fall, cool weather greens, um, kale is for me one of the first things that comes to mind. Um, planting perennial kale in the fall specifically can really be a great way to establish long lasting greens um, in your garden, right? We have some annual, some annual varietals of kale and then some perennial. Um, fall planting of perennial kale will help uh, develop strong root systems leading to a lot more robust growth in the spring. Um, the kale should be planted actually in the next, if you're thinking about doing this year, in the next week or so to make sure that you can establish roots um, before that winter hits. Um, and heavy fabric row covers and some straw mulching can be really helpful um, to help the kale get through those, those colder days. Um, once, once they're ready to cut, um, harvest those outer leaves while keeping the central leaves intact. And that will allow sort of the, the kale to continue, continually produce. Um, but it's perennial kale is really known for its long lifespan. Um, and obviously some very incredible nutritious greens constantly producing in your garden. So just like kale has its annual and its perennial varietals, um, one, one type of broccoli that's really well known for its, it's even in the name, um, its perennial nature is the nine star perennial broccoli. Um, I really like this one because it has, it's known for its nine star because it has nine little clumps of florets um, and it has a genetic mutation that's led to its coloration. Um, now, at some point, maybe in our Q&A or later, if you want to send me a note, I'd love to hear about people's experiences on planting broccoli around this time of the year. Um, ideally, it would be planted a little earlier, so very beginning of fall, um, to allow the plant to take sufficient root before the first frost towards the end of October. Um, these can also be planted in early spring, um, just like rhubarb, so it's definitely something to look forward to. Um, Nine Star Perennial Broccoli is really known for its ability to produce florets year after year. And that unique color, uh, it kind of looks a little bit more like cauliflower and it actually tastes a little bit more like cauliflower too. Um, and the carotenoids that are responsible for the color change in there um, actually have um, great antioxidants as well. Um, so it's both a, it's both healthy for your soil and healthy for your body, which those two things usually, usually go together. Um, the last sort of crop vegetable that I'll, I'll mention, um, is, is lovage. And there's really not a lot to not love about lovage. Um, it's a perennial herb that belongs to the same family as parsley, celery, and carrots. Um, it's now cultivated in many parts of the world. So it's not native to here, uh, originally Southern Europe and Western Asia, um, but there's really so much to love about it. Um, if you do companion or guild planting, it's a really great option because it it attracts so many beneficial beneficial insects. Um, but it's robust and upright. It can even grow seven feet, several feet tall. Um, and I use celery so many times every week. And lovage is actually a really great replacement and a continual replacement for celery. Um, its leaves, stems, and seeds are all edible. So as we think about, you know, making sure that we're, when I'm thinking about uh, eating food that's more sustainable, this is a really great option. Um, it does have a stronger flavor than celery. Um, and it's kind of like a combination between celery and parsley, um, but it's fantastic for our region because um, here it can generally over overwinter without too much support. It definitely benefits from some straw mulching, um, but it does grow very quickly. And I know we've talked, we talked about low maintenance becoming high maintenance. It does grow quickly. Um, so harvesting regularly is definitely important for, for lovage. Um, those are our sort of regular vegetables. Um, I did want to mention a couple very fun uh, fun vegetables or fun edibles here, um, fiddleheads, um, which are the young coiled fronds of certain fern species. Um, so particularly ostrich ferns. Um, these are delicious. They're considered a delicacy in some parts of the world um, for, by some people around here too. Um, they are best harvested when they're still coiled. So they'll extend um, as they as they mature in the spring, but they're best sort of harvested at the beginning of spring. Um, but they can, and they could, should always be cooked. Um, 
but they can be steamed or broiled or roasted and, and the flavors all pair really well with, with butter and garlic. Um, similarly to fiddleheads, hostas can actually be edible, but I would note that not all hostas are edible. Um, there are certain varietals that are, um, and they're best as little tiny sprouts um, and blanched to um, tenderize and to remove any, any bitterness. Um, I am excited to hear from Caitlin later about our pollinators, but on edible perennials, native ed edible perennials, um, this one is by far one of my favorites in terms of native plants. Um, the American ground nut um, is also known as the Indian potato, um, and it's incredibly versatile and extremely unique. Um, the American ground nut produces edible tubers that, so think like potatoes, but they have a very nutty flavor to them. Um, they can be cooked in a lot of the same ways that um, a lot of the same ways that uh, that uh, potatoes are cooked. Um, and this plant is actually a nitrogen fixing, fixing plant as well. So it's going to enrich the soil with nutrients. It's going to benefit neighbor, neighboring plants um, and reduce the need for for additional additives to the soil. Um, because it has a climbing vine system as well, it can stretch up to 15 feet as length in length. Um, it's extremely space efficient. Um, and the flowers, um, it, it attracts pollinators as well. Um, bees, it's host plant for, for butterfly larvae. Um, it's a great habitat and, and food for wildlife actually. Um, and more than anything, it's low maintenance um, and, and a very good companion plant as well. Um, so the American ground nut is, um, I'm probably, I'm a huge advocate of the American ground nut. Um, when we think about perennials traditionally, um, especially in Europe, um, I would be remiss not to mention a couple trees here of our fruit trees. Um, persimmons are, are one of them and are a little bit more popular than the other one I've mentioned, which is pawpaws. Um, those Persimmons are going to produce um, some sweet and flavorful orange to reddish, reddish orange fruits um, late in the summer. Right around now, actually, you'll see trees producing persimmons and pawpaws. Um, pawpaws are not as common, but if you've ever had the chance to eat them, um, you know how fantastic they are. I used to work somewhere that produced pawpaw ice cream um, every year, and it was absolutely incredible. It's kind of a combination of bananas and mangoes. So these are great additions in terms of, of trees. Um, and then finally, I'll just mention um, native berries and, and wild leeks, onions, and garlic can all be fantastic additions um, to introduce to your garden. Um, one berry that I like to mention right around now that's very easy to plant is the service berry, um, which is a little bit like a, like a blueberry. Um, they're helpful to plant now because they do take longer um, to establish and they require a little bit more water when planted in the spring. Um, so now's a really great plant time to plant some service berries. Um, and on the on the front of the the American ground nut, you know, one of my I love I love following, you know, other other gardeners, other farmers, other foragers. Um, and the person who introduced me to um, to the American ground nut actually with absolute excitement um, was a woman named Alexis Nicole, who's known as the Black Forager on Instagram. Um, a couple other resources that I'd recommend to you all are Perennial Vegetables by Eric Toensmeyer. Um, this really is a is a handbook of edible edible perennials. Um, Edible Wild Plants in Eastern and Central North America by Lee Allen Peterson, um, which is obviously local, as well as Foraging Virginia, uh, Finding, Identifying, and Preparing Wild Edible Foods. Um, that's all for my presentation today. I'm so excited to, to hear your questions and hear from you all on your thoughts about edible perennials. Thank you, Amanda. So um, while you were presenting, we had one question come in. Um, the person asks, um, it's Kat, she's asking, for those of us in fairly temporary spaces, what can we plant right now for fall, winter, or early spring harvests? A great question. Um, right now, um, like I mentioned, our, our, it's really time for those, for a lot of those greens. So the perennial kale or regular kale is a great option right around now. Um, 
we're getting ready for for broccoli um you know a lot of those if if we're talking about annuals and perennials um a lot of those more delicate cold weather um spring vegetables are a great option right so um spinach i actually had a slide on sorrel which is an excellent cold weather varietal a uh, really great herb that you can grow right now um so those things that are going to overwinter well um right that are that are more cold hardy or if you have um if you have coverings um things that um are sort of like your lighter your lighter greens is a great is a great option right around now Juan Pablo is asking, where can you find seeds for the broccoli? Thanks, Juan Pablo. Um, I want to know too. I will, I will do some research and get back to you. It's not, I am, imagine, I'm pretty positive I looked and I think Johnny's selected seeds has them. Um, so that's a good, that's a good option. Okay, we have a kind of a comment or pondering um, from Jeffrey. Um, he mentioned that he's grown garlic um, where he lives for over 20 years and he never had an issue. Um, but this year he planted a hundred cloves and only harvested seven. He said the plants grew well in the fall and early spring, um, but there was a solid freeze in April and he's wondering if that's why they didn't make it. That is, that's a good that's a good question, Jeffrey. Um, there could be a couple reasons for that. Um, but I would imagine, you know, even, even if there is a, a solid freeze later in the year, um, they should be hardy enough at that point for it not to, because they're overwintering, they should be hardy enough at that point for it not to bother them too much. Um, but that's a, that's a definite bummer to harvest seven out of those 100. I hope, I hope this next year is, is more productive for you. Um, another question um, is asking, what varieties of garlic are perennial? Great, great question. Um, well, like I mentioned, there's they're all sort of annual or biennial, right? So all forms of garlic um, are going to be, there's an option for them to be both, um, but a lot of them, um, you know, not all of them are going to grow that flower stalk, right? So the ones that are the hard neck varieties are going to be the ones that do have the chance to produce the flower stalk. Um, but in terms of annual versus biennial, almost all garlics are going to be a little bit of both. I do want to actually mention Juan Pablo responded to the earlier comment um, on the garlic struggles, and he blames the drought from spring and early summer. Yeah, the farm I work at, the garlic harvest was not great this year. So yeah. I'm not sure uh, what's going on there. Um, where can we find the ground nut if we want to plant that? A great question. Um, any of your local sort of local reputable nursery will be able to, you can get it from them. Um, I also recommend, you know, I go with Johnny's Selected Seeds a lot for a lot of things. Um, I can drop a couple links into the chat just a little bit later, right before our, our next Q&A of, of places that you would be able to shop for them. Okay, I think this will be our last question for you and we'll have a chance for more questions, hopefully at the end. What would you recommend, uh, Kate is asking, what would you recommend for someone who's brand new? What would you recommend they start with? That's a great question, Kate. Thanks for joining. Um, I would recommend, you know, for me, recommend talking to people, engaging with people who are super passionate about it, um, who are super passionate about growing their own vegetables and excited about it. Um, I would start there um, and start learning from them. Um, if you're totally new to gardening in general, you know, container planting is always a really great place to start. Um, but mostly I would recommend finding finding those people around you who are, or people on the internet, people who you respect, um, who are super excited about growing their own food um, and, and seeing what they recommend and what they're working on. Um, can you, someone's asking if you can put up your slide with the book references. 
I will actually, Ben, I can absolutely just drop that list right into the chat and that way you guys can all have it and pull from it. Great, thank you. We are going to ask, um, we're gonna transition speakers. We're gonna ask Caitlin to pull up her slides and share with us. And we're gonna learn about some native plants that we can help out our pollinators. Take it away, Caitlin. Thank you so much, Cassandra, and thank you, Amanda, to that um, for that great presentation. I learned a lot, and now I want to plant ground nuts in my garden. Um, I am not a great vegetable grower, so hopefully this will inspire me um, to do a little bit better. So um, I'm here tonight from the Fairfax County Master Gardener Program. Our mission is to share science-based educational information about gardening in our region. We are sponsored by the Virginia's two land-grant universities, Virginia State University and Virginia Tech. And so tonight, I'm very excited to be here to talk about native plants. This is my favorite subject. I will talk to anybody about it who will listen. So thank you for being my victims tonight. Um, but I'm here to talk about how native plants can help um, your vegetable garden be more successful, more productive, and more diverse. So um, first, I want to start by defining what a native plant is. So it's pretty simple. It's a plant that's indigenous to the region. So it naturally occurs in a given environment. This gets a little, if you want to really argue about it, there are some things that have been introduced, but have been here for long enough that they kind of count as native. But, you know, broadly, it's something that, you know, grew here, belongs here, continues to live here. Um, many of the plants that we see at garden centers are what are called ornamental exotics, and they grow beautifully, and they're very pretty to put in your garden, but they're native to another part of the world. And sometimes not all of them, but a lot of them can escape cultivation, as we refer to it, and become problems. And so in our area, an example of that is, of course, bamboo. We have all heard a lot about it. We've all seen a lot about it. I have some in my yard. Um, but this is something that has, you know, escaped cultivation and has made itself at home here without any, you know, natural predators or things that would eat it to help control it. Pollinators are, um, they fulfill essential functions in our ecosystems. Um, they serve a key role in the reproduction of plants. And that means we get seeds, we get fruits, we get vegetables, we get all the great things that, you know, we want our garden to produce. And it's, you know, we and many other animals depend on these things to survive. So as I emphasized in this slide, pollinators are responsible for 85% of the world's flowering plants plants and two thirds of our crop species. That's a huge portion of what we eat. Pollinators are also a keystone species, which means that they're essential parts of our ecosystem and of the food web. So if we don't have pollinators or if they're threatened or in decline, then our food systems and our food web start to collapse. So I'm not being dramatic by saying that, you know, if we didn't have pollinators, all of us would starve. So there are probably two pollinators that immediately come to mind when you say, you know, plant for pollinators are like, oh, a monarch butterfly or a bee, but there are so many more. Um, pollinators include solitary bees. They include bumblebees, wasps, beetles, butterflies that we know and love, moths, and even flies. So there are a ton of pollinators out there that we might not know or appreciate. And so Amanda covered a little bit of this because a lot of the native perennials you know, obviously offer the same benefit, um, but native plants support native pollinators. And these pollinators and the plants have co-evolved to thrive in our local environment. They provide food and habitat for wildlife and, for, and most of all, they're quite beautiful. So these are some photos that I snapped in my yard. Um, I'm always delighted to be able to walk outside. You know, it doesn't matter if it's morning, afternoon or night, there's something going on there. Um, there are insects buzzing through. I see birds eating things. Um, in my small, someone in the chat said they're here in Lincolnia. I am also in Lincolnia, but I have rabbits, I have owls, I have foxes. Um, I was delighted to find a snake in my yard this spring. So um, there's a lot of wildlife that will benefit from these plants. So because your garden needs pollinators to produce fruit and vegetables, um, the pollinators need food and habitat for themselves. So you will be best served if you have some space, you don't need a ton to incorporate some native plants in your garden. Um, if you provide native plants, you'll be shocked to see how quickly birds and pollinators and you know all of the beneficial life that you need in your ecosystem will return to your yard. 
Um, so as master gardeners, one of the things that we get asked a lot is how you handle pest control. And I use pests in air quotes. Um, obviously there are some insects that can be destructive and we, you know, we'll deal with those as they come. But most pests or things that we consider pests are part of the food web themselves. And so if you have native plants, you're going to attract beneficial insects, predatory insects that are gonna take care of some of these problem pests for you and help you know, do the work that you don't have to go spray or do any, you know, you don't have to do anything. They'll just come in and take care of the any overgrowth that you have. Nature wants to be in balance, um, let the beneficial insects help you. And then Amanda touched on this a little bit too. So, you know, we talk about healthy soil and as gardeners, we're always trying to like add compost and fertilizer and do soil tests and things like that. But native plants will help balance and provide um, biodiversity. They will um, improve the soil health. And we hear a lot about this in Fairfax County. We have a lot of um, stormwater erosion and all of those deep root systems that native plants put down will help improve soil infiltration, um, water infiltration to the soil, and everything will benefit from that. Plus, I can't say this enough, native plants are really, really pretty. So one note, we all hear this a lot, save the bees. Um, and I just wanna note that not all bees are created equal. Um, many of you like have seen European honeybees, like on the one on the left, um, and have heard about colony collapse disorder, which is you know very serious problem in mass produced agriculture. Um, these bees, you know, you hear about them moving hives from farm to farm, and a lot of these bees are essential for that mass scale food production. However, they're not the same as our native bees. They are, as their name implies, a European honeybee, and a lot of the native bees that we know and depend on are native bees. So you'll see on the left, the European honeybee has little pollen sacs on its legs. Um, they mix the pollen to make a paste and put it on their back legs and that's how they carry it um, back to the hives. The native bees are a little bit messier, which is maybe another reason why I love them so much, um, but they carry all of the pollen grains in spiky hairs on their body. And so that's not as secure. And so as they fly around and collect more, they pollinate the plants. Um, so they're a little bit more effective Quite a bit more effective than our European honeybees. And they are co-evolved to be, you know, part of our ecosystem. So I'm going to take kind of a dark turn for a minute. Um, this is a slightly older article from the New York Times. It was written in 2018, but it's even more valid today because I'm sure it has still continued. Um, but as humans, we don't like bugs, we think they're icky, we don't want them in their house, we're like, oh, you know, and I am guilty of that too. If one catches me by surprise, then I'm kind of like, ah. But if you start to appreciate what they can do in your garden and how important they are in the ecosystem, then they're not quite so yucky. Um, this article, again, a few years old, but the monarch butterfly population has fallen by 90% in the last 20 years. And that's a loss of 900 million individuals, that's huge. And the rusty patch bumblebee, um, which once lived in 28 states, has dropped by 87% around the world. Um, so this article, I found a very sobering call to action. Um, and the author advocates for more research around how important insects are to ecosystems. And I certainly support that. Um, but if you'd like to read about this and get a little extra uh, enthusiasm for how insects in your garden can benefit everyone, I would uh, suggest a read. And I have that at the end of my uh, slide deck with the um, other resources. Another thing that you can do to help beneficial insects in your garden um, and save yourself some work is leave the leaves. This is a very timely and seasonal. Um, leaves are like free mulch. So if you can rake them into a corner of the, your yard or use them to mulch out your garden beds, which is what I do, you'll provide a wonderful spot for beneficial insects and other creatures to overwinter. And then they will be ready to spring into action in your garden in the spring um, once things warm up. So if you can do that manually, don't use a leaf blower, don't use a mulching lawn or anything like that. Just gently move leaves to a different part of your property. Um, you will reap great benefits for your ecosystem. So like Amanda, I'm going to go through a couple recommended plants. I'm going to go through this fairly quickly, but I'm always happy to take questions at the end. Um, 
these are things that I, again, have in my garden, have had good success with, and I tried to keep things that were relatively well behaved. I have some native plants that, you know, are like eight and 10 feet tall. These are not those. Um, if you have the space to do that, I would recommend it because they're wonderful, but these are a little bit more like, you know, traditional cultivation type things. So blue indigo, these are two early spring plants. Blue indigo is a member of the um, legume family and it blooms quickly, very early. Then it gets these cool seed pods on it and they rattle. Um, they add a lot of textural interest to your garden. They add a lot of textural interest all winter. The stalks will stay up. And so there's something to look at even when it's you know brown and snowy outside. Um, and then golden ragwort is another spring plant that I look forward to seeing. It's one of the first things to bloom. It's always so welcome in that you know, you feel like winter's never going to end and then here the ragwort blooms and it's a really important food source for bees that are just emerging from their winter dormancy. Then as we move into summer, butterfly weed is a classic. You see this sold everywhere. It's wonderful. Um, it's very kind of low profile, well behaved. You can stick it in the corner of your garden if you only have a little bit of space. And you'll of course attract monarch butterflies, but also milkweed beetles and other beneficial insects. Um, and then of course, Coreopsis is another beautiful garden plant. It has pretty kind of, this is a thread leaf variety. So the leaves are very uh, thin and pretty to look at. Lots of yellow abundant flowers that last a long time. So that's a really nice addition to your garden as well. Scarlet bee balm is one I think that a lot of us see. It's kind of old fashioned, but um, this one's a little bit taller, but I love it. And so I had to include it and it'll spread. It's been well behaved in my garden, but um, if it, is really enthusiastic. You'll have lots to give away to your friends. And then, um, of course, purple cone flower is another really pretty, beautiful kind of classic cut flower for your garden that you can put out there. You can watch goldfinches eat the seeds. That's what I'm seeing this time of year. Birds just feasting um, and they'll eat, up, eat those seeds all winter long. And then, of course, as we're heading into fall, these are sites that many of us are familiar with. You see the asters and the goldenrod blooming about this time. And a really cool thing about these plants is that the purple and yellow together make them more highly visible to bees. And so both plants benefit and that's part of why they have evolved to bloom together at this time of year. And you often see that combination of purple and yellow in the garden. And that's in one of the books, again, that's on my resources list, but one of those kind of fascinating garden things and why both of those are blooming this time of year. So I put together um, a lot of recommendations. I do a lot of reading about this. I have you know, several Instagram accounts that I like to follow and thought you might enjoy as well. Um, I've cited all the articles that I used as references in this presentation, including the New York Times Magazine article about the insect apocalypse. A couple Instagram accounts that I thought you'd enjoy. One is the Humane Gardener. She's actually a master gardener in Maryland, so she's regional here. And she posts wonderful, um, observations in her garden, wonderful writings about what she sees, and kind of an interesting take on approaching wildlife in your garden instead of seeing it as an adversary, seeing it as something that's welcome. Margaret Rankle is an author in Tennessee. I think she's based in Nashville, and she does a lot of nature writing for the New York Times. She, again, is a wonderful observer of nature, someone who encourages us all, encourages us all to be backyard naturalists, which is wonderful. And then, of course, Earth Sangha, they don't have the busiest social media presence, but they're another great uh, source, local source of native plants and native plant information. And then finally, because I'm very old fashioned um, and like to have paper books in my hand, um, Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer. I'm sure everybody in this meeting has heard of this if they haven't read it. Um, it there's a reason that it's been on the nonfiction best of list for I think years at this point. But it's a wonderful reference and a, again, a wonderful way to approach the natural world. Um, Nancy Lawson, the humane gardener on Instagram, her book is also wonderful and eye-opening about how um, we can approach our backyard gardens in different ways. Doug Tallamy, he's probably the best known in this area, but his most recent book called Nature's Best Hope is focused on how our backyard gardens can be really powerful uh, change agents in ecosystem support and how they can support native plants and animals. So that would be a great place to start if you're completely new to all this and you're like, I don't know anything about native plants or bugs or anything like that. He's an entomologist, but he writes in a very approachable way. And finally, um, if you want to have a book with pretty pictures of plants that you can flip through or take with you to the garden store, Pollinators of Native Plants by Heather Holm is a great um, 
resource that I would recommend to anyone. So with that, um, I talk really fast. I'm happy to take any questions if anything's come up or um, I'm sure Amanda is available to take more questions too if you have any for her. Thank you, Caitlin. So we have a few questions. Um, I will, I guess, open up to both you, Caitlin and Amanda, because some of them may have crossover. Um, so one, Linda is asking if you could add links for native edible seed suppliers. Um, that would be great. You could do that, Amanda. Um, Barbara asks, what about decayed vegetable leaves like bean leaves, should they be left on the ground after harvest or cleared? I can jump in and take that one if a man has anything to add, certainly welcome. Or if you, you have anything you'd like to say. Um, as long as they aren't diseased, usually if something has, um, has you know, has died because it, it ailed, you don't wanna leave that in your garden. But other than that, you could add it to your compost pile or, you know, leave it where it is for the winter. You probably want to clear it off when you plan again the next year, but it won't hurt anything if you leave it for the winter season. I, yeah, I would echo that. And I would just add, um, if, if lawns are getting sprayed too, um, specifically for edible edibles, you know, if you're putting, if you're putting leaves that have been in proximity to any sort of lawn spray, you really want to be careful about, about leaf mulch there. Um, but if it's from your own yard and you don't spray, then absolutely by all means. Okay, hey, um, are there any native plants that can distract or ward off squash borers? Amanda, you look like you might have an answer. Yeah, um, I'm laughing because squash borers uh, are the bane of my existence. Um, I, I appreciated Kat's response here. The only thing that I will add to that is, is uh, that mint can also um, help with them. Um, but even with mint, I mean, you also have to be, there's a balance there, right? Because because mint can very easily take over um, everything. Um, so you've created another problem and maybe possibly solve the one you have. Um, if anyone else has any ideas for squash borers, I will also, also take them. And I would just say that, you know, planting Native plants will encourage all those, like I said, those predatory insects. It won't solve all of your problems, but it will definitely welcome some things in that think that squash borers are a, a great snack. Okay, um, Juan Pablo would like to know if there are some native pollinators that we can plant in the shade. Yeah, absolutely. Um, off the top of my head, I know the golden ragwort will grow literally anywhere. Um, and there are a lot of things that, whether you have dry shade or wet shade will determine it. Um, but Plant Nova Natives, which is one of the resources that I put on my slides and happy to have you send those out, Cassandra, if that helps, or I can drop them in the chat. They have guides for different soil types that you have. So if you have dry shade, wet shade, I have both. So you're gonna put very different things in either place. Um, but a lot of things, even cone flowers will grow well in park shade. Um, if you have kind of a mix. And if you could put your um, resources in the chat, that would be great. It looks like we have a, a suggestion for the squash borer in the comments, some, um, putting the pie, plant, pie pans around the base of the squash is supposed to help disorient the bugs. So maybe we could give that a try. Does anyone else have any questions for either Caitlin or Amanda? You can put them in the chat. We have about 11 minutes, uh, so we probably could take another three or four questions. I actually have a question for Caitlin. Um, I would love to hear about some native varietals for rockier soil. I know we have a lot of clay around here, um, but are there things that would do really well in, in rocky soil? Yeah, I have things that like to be, I have um, several things that have done well. It's rocky and clay and dry and just like the surface of the moon. Um, Hypericum or St. John's wort does well there. It seems happy. It's 
terrible. The soil you have to like chip, you know, away with a shovel to dig any, to dig a hole and I'm like, good luck. And it went crazy. Um, iron weed has done well there too. It's hot and dry and rocky. Um, and there are some shorter varieties of that that won't grow to be eight feet tall. Um, i trying to think what else has, has done well there. Also weirdly Amsonia, which I think would also like to be wet has done fairly well there. And that's a really pretty, um, gets pretty leaves. It has nice fall color. And so it's kind of one of those great plants that has all season interest. Thank you. All right, Marilyn is asking, can you offer guidance on how to collect native seeds this fall? I'd like to start my own native plants for next year's garden. Um, Marilyn, are you meaning uh, like not purchasing, but collecting, collecting seeds from existing natives? Or do you mean, um, yeah, sort of finding places to get native seed? Perfect. Seed saving, I think. Um, so Aster is ragwort. Caitlin, that looks like a question. Oh, Aster is in the ragwort. That looks like a question for you. <laughs> Not sure what the question is, but those would... Um... Uh, she was asking for guidance on how to collect native seeds. This oh, month. okay. There are different thoughts on collecting wild seeds. Um, and so maybe this is an opportunity to reach out to friends who might have native plants in their garden that are going to seed now. It's very easy to collect the seed heads from their garden or you know transplants this time of year or in the spring. That might be a little bit more ethical. Um, then picking up things that are you know wild in the woods. And there's also, I'll give another plug to Earth Sangha, um, which is a local ecotype nursery. So they're all locally grown seeds that they, propagate at their nursery. And so those are going to be really hyper local plants. Um, but you probably shouldn't go gather them out in the woods. And plant exchanges, someone just put in the, the chat. That's a great idea too. Awesome. And it looks like Earth Sangha is having a sale on October 1st. Mark your calendars. I'm not endorsing them exclusively. I'm just saying it's a great, as master gardeners, we support all retailers, but that's a great one. And they are having that open house. Um, Caitlin and Amanda have put some of the resources in the chat, so I'd encourage everyone to capture um, anything that you were um, curious about. You can scroll up in the chat and capture some of the um, resources that they've mentioned during their presentation. I will. I will also mention for for a lot of the edibles, you know, uh, Exchanges are a really great way to get some of those those bulbs for things like garlic or or onions. Um, yeah, doing things like exchanges, basically finding more opportunities to find other people who care about gardening, so that you can be friends with them and then exchange things with them. That's the way to go. <laughs> I second that. That's amazing. Yeah, I've even seen like a seed bank at some libraries. Um, there are lots of gardening Facebook groups. Um, I know that you, you might, if your neighbor has some plants, they probably would like to give you some of their hostas because they get massive, you know. So I would, I would just talk to people and maybe um, if you're on social media, join a gardening group and see who's willing to share. I have one more plant sale to plug before we go. Um, next, this weekend actually, on Saturday, Green Spring Gardens here in uh, Fairfax County is having their fall garden day. And they'll have a variety of vendors that, you know, so there might be some of those fall vegetables that you could pick up, um, fall perennials, things that you can still plant now. So that if you have no plans on Saturday, mark your calendars for that too. I wanna thank Amanda and Caitlin for um, taking the time to put together these great presentations. Thanks for sharing your knowledge with us. We really appreciate it. Um, I also want to give thank uh, Virginia Cooperative Extension for setting up the Zoom and the registration for this workshop. Um, I want to thank the Fairfax Food Council um, and specifically the Urban Agriculture Working Group, um, of which I'm a co-chair. 
Um, Diane, if you can, please put a the email address for the um, Food Council in the chat. So if anyone wants to reach us, re reach out to us, um, please do. If you want to join our mailing list, you can go ahead and email and join um, the Food Council's mailing list. I um, also want to thank Arcadia, the Center for Sustainable Agriculture, for sponsoring um, this workshop. Thank you all. Have Thank a great you. night. Good night. Thank you.